Welcome back, everyone, to the morning buzz here on WMSC Upper Montclair. And we have a special guest all the way from the sunny state of Florida. I'm jealous of the weather. I've been jealous. We have Miguel Fuller. How are you doing, sir? Wonderful. And I will tell you that the weather is fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Why? Yeah. It's uh, 70 degrees, no humidity. Uh, it was like chilly for us this morning, but you can definitely wear shorts today. I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt while you are in a nice tropical themed button up. The jealousy <laughs> is real, but I will say I'm going on vacation to Puerto Rico soon. So, you know, there's levels to it, you know, Florida, Puerto Rico, you know, Absolutely. I got to take my small wins. <laughs> <laughs> So you are on here, the show, you are a radio host yourself in the mornings. Mm -hmm. Tell me how exactly you got started on your journey through radio. Yeah, so I've always been interested in entertaining people and being some sort of entertainer. Uh, but when I was younger, I really focused in on audio. There was something really special that spoke to me about it. Um, like when I was younger, way back before, you would probably remember when there were tape players, cassette tape players, <laughs> and I would, uh, you know, like take a song off the radio, record myself talking between the songs. I would like lock myself in my room and record a morning show of me being like the host and the guest and the co-host. And my mom thought that something was wrong with me because I would just be playing all these different voices. And she was like, what is wrong with my son? Um, and then in middle school, we had a uh, radio station that went a mile around our uh, campus. And so I joined the middle school radio station where we just basically read the lunch menu and the announcements. And then I had a high school radio station that I got to be a part of and help craft that, that broadcasted just to the cafeteria. And then when I got to college, I did radio there and I got to work at this like classic rock South Georgia radio station. And as a uh, black man, as a gay black man, I was like, well, I got to get my foot in the door somehow. If this is it, I'm gonna work at the big dog. And so that was like my first, first foot into professional radio. And then I went on to study it at a Georgia Southern University and worked part-time in Savannah at what was then Clear Channel Radio, which is now iHeart Media. And then that just started set my professional career into gear. Wow, what a transition for that little college radio um, from what they play and who you are. Definitely interesting there. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you obviously are a morning show host yourself. And I'm, I've always wondered this about other hosts, but what is the process for you in getting ready for that show? And then also how you run your show as well. Yeah, so it's changed through the years where uh, I used to, when I first started, I would like wake up, you know, 30 minutes before the show and we'd sort of prep as we went along. And now as I've gotten older in a, a bigger market, there's more at stake. Um, and plus two, just, I, I now know more about how I like to work. So I like to get there super early. So I get there about two hours before the show starts. Um, and so throughout the day, like this afternoon, like I just got home from work now. And so I will sort of take my time and I'll see a story here or something will happen to me during the day or one of my co-hosts or our producer will text me something. And so it's sort of like I get together these little puzzle pieces throughout the day of pop culture and life things. And so then when I get there in the morning around 4.15, I then start putting all those puzzle pieces together about, all right, so my producer Scott had something interesting that happened to him on a side hustle uh, this weekend because he DJs weddings. And then my co-host Holly had something crazy happen with her eight-year-old daughter this weekend. And then my fiance and I did something. So then I sort of, then with that, we have all the pop culture things that may have happened. So then I sort of put together those puzzle pieces um, and then you, I write teases and craft how I want to tease everything out. And then it sort of lays out the show. I sort of create the master plan. And then uh, Scott, my producer, he comes in around five and he starts gathering audio and editing any phone calls that we wanted to play back from the day before, anything that we recorded. And then Holly 
gets in around 5.30 and then she starts putting together the trending report um, and seeing what happened overnight, what happened yesterday that we need to talk about, what are the top things we need to cover. Um, and so then we start around 5.50 and then we're off and running. Wow, that's So what time do you wake up um, to start your day? 3.15 in the morning. 3.15. Wow. That is, I thought when I got up, it was early, but 3.15. How do you, some people drink coffee, some people drink tea. What is your natural kind of energizer for you? So it's changed through the years. When I first started, um, I could not do coffee. I thought coffee was bitter. It was gross. And I was like, Ugh. And I'm, I'm always trying to be more healthy, especially waking up at this hour. So I used to drink crystal light energy drink and water. And I was like, well, this is good. I'm getting my water in for the day. And then there's this little thing called aspartame that would just gut punch my stomach. Um, and so I had to stop that. And then I found this sort of like natural energy ca caffeinated thing called spark. Uh, so I did that for a little bit and then you realize you build up a tolerance and so you got to add to the reinforcements. And so about two years ago, one of our producers that no longer work for us, he, he turned me on to cold brew coffee. So mm. now I'm a coffee drinker. And hey, welcome to the club. Oh, I I'll show you right now. Come on, join <laughs> us. <laughs> I said that I always was like, you'll never be a coffee drinker. You're going to be just naturally energetic and you're going to have life. And then when you hit 30, your body's like, ha ha, that's what you thought. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it happened a lot earlier for me. <laughs> I, I think it hit when um, probably 19. It's like, you're going to become a coffee drinker. now. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I held off as long as I could. So now I have my, my cold brew coffee every morning. I, I give you the credit. I will say, uh, something I've noticed is, so right, I'm a senior, kind of a senior. Anyways, so a lot of our uh, newscasters and sportscasters, they come in and they're freshmen or sophomore. And what I've noticed is that all of them drink monster energy at like six in the morning. And I'm just like, no, how can you do this to your body so early? You're still so young. Yes, that is a uh, uh, a full collision course mm -hmm. crashing hard because hard. what happens is you build up that tolerance and you're like, well, if I have one monster drink, let me have two. Yeah. Let me have another monster drink. And then before you know it, your heart is like beating out of your chest, mm -hmm. like you're a cartoon and then you're passed out. <laughs> so it's like you just, and then, you know, and then honestly, there are just some days where, you know what? we're humans and I'm just going to be tired. I've, yeah. had, I've had my coffee. I've tried to wake up. And that's one of the hardest things as a recovering perfectionist is that some days I'm just going to be tired. I can eat right. I can sleep well, but then some days your body's just like, nope, my, I'm not in the game today. And you just got to fake it till you make it. Absolutely. <laughs> So what I've noticed in, in what makes a good radio show or any show in general is the chemistry between hosts. And I feel a lot of times, at least from my personal experience, you can normally tell when you have really good chemistry with the person by your first interaction with them. And so I was wondering from your perspective, for your chemistry, did that naturally click with Holly or is that something you guys built over time? So it was natural. Um, we've been working together for a long time. Um, we started, so at the time it was the fall of 2000, no, it was the spring of 2008. I was working in Savannah. Holly had just started working with, um, an old classmate of mine, um, from college who had gotten a job hosting a morning show in Panama city the year before. And a few months later, he put out a call to find a co-host. Holly was in Ohio, she applied, came down, you know, and was like, I've never been to Florida before, I think once for a cruise. Um, and she was like, let's go, whatever, I'm in my twenties, let's go for it, that's what we do in radio. So she went down, it was the two of them for a few months. I was in Savannah, had just graduated college and I was just miserable at my first job, it was not what I was expecting. And just, I wasn't a right fit for where I was. And I was trying to apply for jobs all over the country. Well, there was this morning show convention that used to happen 
where some of our mentors that we had sort of been idolizing were gonna be at this conference, but you could only go if you were on a morning show. So we lied and said that I was on, I lived in Panama City, even though I lived in Savannah. We said I was part of the morning show. So I met them, um, I don't even remember what city it was. Oh, it was Charlotte where the morning show conference was. Uh, I drove up there, they drove from Panama City. I drove from Savannah, met them and we pretended like we were a morning show. Well, that was the first time I met Holly. And the first night after we went to the little reception and everyone was like, oh, so tell us about this morning show. And I was just like, mm-hmm, it's real fun. <laughs> My first time meeting Holly. Uh, and that night we went out to dinner and we had some drinks and we instantly, the three of us were like, wow, this could be a show. We've never even thought about Miguel coming here. So we worked out with the bosses that be. And so we, I ended up moving to Panama City. Well, in order for me to move, they were like, we don't have any moving money. We don't have any part-time money or any full-time money. So we can make you part-time in hopes that a full-time job will come open. And I was so miserable at the time where I was, I was like, all right, let's do it. Well, because I was going to be part-time, I couldn't afford rent. So only meeting Holly once, I moved from Savannah and moved right in with Holly. And it could have been a recipe for disaster. <laughs> instantly, we became best friends. And we knew that, like, all right, we're going to be working together in some capacity for a long time. And that was all the way back in July of 2008. Wow. That's great, though. What are the odds that it worked out, you know? I mean, because anybody else, it probably wouldn't have worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, you know, when you know, like our current producer, Scott, he was a promotions assistant and uh, I was about two or three years ago, we were at a live broadcast and I pulled up as the talent and they had all the table and tent set up. And one of the older uh, promotions assistants, they were like, hey, Miguel, Scott's new. He's interested in being on the air and most of the promotion assistants aren't. And I was like, oh my God, well, Tell me about your interest and what do you want to do? And as soon as he started talking, I was like, there is something there. There is something there. We're going to gel with him. So I was like, hey, come to the studio, come hang out, see, you know, and ask, feel free to ask some questions. So this is what you want to do. And he never left. Wow. Another one. See, that's why it's just sometimes when it feels right, it feels right. And that's, I think that's the key to a really good show is if you just naturally everything clicks you know what I mean absolutely there is yeah. a lot of science that goes behind uh, you know crafting the perfect tease and the placement of a certain segment but then there's just intangible magic that just happens mm -hmm. that you cannot put a name or label on it you just know it when it's happening and you can feel it and it's like this I always describe it as this like crackle in the air when everyone's laughing you're firing all cylinders and you're like yes this is what a radio show is supposed to be doing. 100%. So you and Holly actually recently just did a live show experience. And I'm curious, what was that like? And also, what was the creative process in creating an event like that? So that was something we've been wanting to do for a very, very long time, because we have some mentors in Houston. Uh, shout out to Rule and Ryan and producer Eric and uh, Special K at KRBE in Houston, they've been doing this live show for years. And I sort of looked from over here in Florida and I was like, wow, that looks so exciting. Because one of the things that Holly and I always talked about is as kids who were in high school, who separately, I was in Atlanta, she was in Ohio and she was in band and I was in show choir. And we, I, we both loved just being on stage and entertaining. But when you do a radio show, you're in a small little room with you know three other people and you're just talking to lots of other people. But whenever we get on stage, it's usually to intro an artist. So everyone else is there to see whoever else is performing. Well, we're like, well, I mean, we're not singers and we're not actors and we're not comedians, but like, we like to be on stage and make people laugh. And so sort of putting together this as we described it, this like Vegas style like show where it was all of the things that we do, but performed on stage. So it wasn't just like a, here's a table and like three microphones. It was us bringing those, what we call bits to life. 
And so we just went through and said, all right, so we do this bit called Tampa Bay Secrets every Thursday where listeners submit anonymous secrets. And then on the show, I read them and then Holly and Scott react. Well, we were like, all right, well, that doesn't really sound exciting to do that on stage. How can we turn it up a notch and make it more interactive? And we said, all right, we will have a QR code that will take people to a site. And while they're standing in line to get in, they can give their secrets. So you have a room full of people that have submitted some very scandalous secrets. And so that means everyone's gonna be looking around like, who cheating on who? Who is here with the ex while their current person is out of town? And thankfully it worked. And so we had so much fun with the audience and with our, our, we call them our fan members, uh, just being playful. So just thinking about how we could bring all of the things that we do on the air sort of to, from 2D to 3D and to make it come to life on stage. So that was sort of the concept behind it. And it was just a, as a radio person who you always feel like the the bottom rung of the media, like we're like the, the red, redheaded stepchild of the media, we truly felt like, hey, like we can command a crowd. We can be on stage people. People paid money to see us. Like I had so many radio friends that were like, that was really cool. Like y'all put on a free show. And we were like, oh no, no, no. People paid to see radio people on stage. Like mm -hmm. everyone was like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. And I'm like, we all have it in us. We're all entertainers. It's just thinking about it in a different capacity. A thousand percent. Some of like the best personalities, I think, at some point, somewhere, somehow, they've probably been on radio in any capacity. And it it's a great way to build your persona, I guess, because it is a, not a character, but you know, you understand what I mean in that sense. It's, it's I always say that being on the radio is you times 10%. Yes. It's the most entertaining parts of yourself. It's like a reality show. Like when you watch a Bravo show or any of the MTV shows, you know, they don't film them just sitting around reading a book. Like that's not interesting. They film that 10% of really exciting stuff that happens in their life. And that's what being on the radio is. Like, you know, when we're done, I'm going to read my book that I've been reading because I'm really ready to get to the end of it. And I'm excited. Like, I'm not going to go on air tomorrow and be like, well, I read a book. It was fun. Like something will happen today that'll be really crazy and you find that and you nitpick it and you take it out. But that's the beauty of radio is you learn how to be a storyteller. You learn how to observe life and how to, oh, well, I can already tell you what I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. When I came in the house earlier or a little bit ago, there was a note from one of my neighbors that asked us not to park in their driveway because oh my God. <laughs> walking there, I'm like, do I need to respond? Is this a fight? Like, are we in a fight with my neighbor? Like, what do I do? So like, boom, I already have content for tomorrow just by walking in the door. So it radio teaches you how to be observant and how to always be looking at the conflict in your life. Absolutely. So I have a question for you, um, mm -hmm. obviously, since I'm interviewing you. Um, <laughs> but a lot of us here at the station are still in college because it is a college radio station. And a lot of us would like to, at some point, develop a career in radio. So what advice would you give to us in our journey into the professional environment? Uh, first off, best advice that was ever given to me, get your foot in the door now. So if there is a local radio station around you, go intern. If they don't do interns anymore, work in the promotions department as a promotions assistant. Things are really crazy right now after COVID. So some stations still aren't doing events. If they're not doing events, see if they have like some sort of digital thing, just find your way in the door. Even if it's doing sales or being a sales assistant, just find your way into the building somehow. And then that's when you start to network and you show your personality. And also something that didn't exist when I was there is like social media, like we had Facebook and MySpace back then, but it wasn't used in a professional setting. But like now that's one of the metrics that we use for success. Cause like with the way they do ratings, it's so, uh, it fluctuates and it's not super reliable. So now when looking at jobs, 
they don't just look at how are your ratings. They look at your social interaction. Are you talking? Are you creating content on your own? Are you uh, interacting with your audience that's responding to it? You know, do you produce content regularly? How do you present yourself? So it's sort of a good thing and a bad thing because you all have these tools at your disposal of being able to showcase your personality and create an audience already on your own. But then at the same time, it sucks because like you don't have someone to teach you how to do that. So we had the the thankfully be able to come up and like learn how to do those things on the radio. And then we transferred them to social media. But you all kind of have to do the reverse, do it on social media to show, hey, I've got a following. Like on our promotions team right now, we have a guy that has like 700,000 TikTok followers. And I was like, well, let me take my little 6,000 yeah. on my TikTok and go sit down. But like, that's an upper hand. So now he's great at telling stories on TikTok. If he wants to be on the air, he has to now transfer those skills to on air. So just sort of doing all of those together by putting your foot in the door and then already like cultivating that personality on social media to show what makes you special. Because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for like, in radio, we can teach anybody how to speak with a good voice, how to say the right things, but no one can teach you how to be a personality. That's the intangible part that you have to bring to the table and showcase on your social media. You know what? Uh, for me, I like to end interviews on a, on a more lighter note, very random question that comes to my mind. So earlier, as I was trying to you know research all these things about you, I was stalking a little bit in, in a polite way, obviously, uh, uh, <laughs> I saw that you recently conquered something that many people across the world still have yet to conquer. And it's something that, you know, I've been able to do very easily because I love the water. But yeah. you have finally learned how to swim. How does that feel? Uh, it's amazing. It's <laughs> sort of like riding, like if you've never learned how to ride a bike. And all of a sudden, as an adult, you're like, I finally get it. Or learning how to drive. Like, it's one of those life skills that everyone should know. But depending upon where you grew up or the traumas that your family passed down on you, or maybe a trauma you have from maybe accidentally drowning in the water, uh, it's something that we fear. And so I went on vacation this summer to the Virgin Islands. And uh, my fiance and our friends we went with, we chartered a boat for one of the days we were there. And I thought that we were like, just gonna go to a beach and like post up and just be on the beach. But it was like, no, no, we're going to different spots, but you have to like jump off the boat, swim to the shore. And when we got there, my fiance was like, ooh, what are we gonna do about you? And I was like, it's fine. I'll be on a boat just having some drinks. It's fine. Well, then after like the fifth place, when everyone got off the boat and I was just sitting by myself, I was like, all right, I need to learn. Like this is, I'm 36. This is enough. I've got to take responsibility and learn how to swim. So as soon as I got back from vacation, I hit up our local YMCA and I was like, do y'all do adult lessons? Would you mind if I like chronicled my journey on the air and they were like cool no problem and so then from there we started the whole all, this whole fall basically of me learning how to swim so it's been super exciting I'm ready to like even though like it's 70 degrees here like it's not the water isn't good to get in now mm -hmm. but I am excited in the spring to finally get to the beach and when I used to avoid going hanging out with friends I'm actually excited to say I'll take you up on that offer. I'll meet you at the beach. That's really cool. Hey, it's never too late to learn something like that. And maybe one day I will learn how to ride a bike. Today is not that day, but <laughs> that... <laughs> soon, soon enough. Soon, right? Uh, that does conclude our interview, though. Thank you so much, Miguel Fuller, for coming in on the show. We appreciate you. And who knows, maybe one day you'll even return to the show. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, enjoy. Back to you guys in the studio.